everyone. This is Roman for Kopchuk, and this is the Digital Savage Experience Podcast. Today, I have with me JB Glossinger. JB is known to hundreds of thousands of people over the world as the Morning Coach. A successful motivational speaker, podcaster, and coach, JB's daily podcast has been downloaded over 40 million times. By working to align his mission, values, and goals, JB has been able to create a life of helping others while still spending time with family, writing, and golfing. JB is passionate about helping entrepreneurs transform their lives. Thank you for joining me today. Roman, what's up, brother? Good to have you, man. Good to be here. I'm used to doing it. I'm used to being on the other side. So I'm always like, good to have you. <laughs> so good to be here, brother. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're a veteran compared to me, but you know. We're all veterans. We're all veterans, man. It's just a matter of time. Yep. Happy to have you on. So tell me a little bit about your journey for the audience. How did you get to where you are today? Oh, God. I mean, a lot of sucking, basically. Um, I was in corporate for a while. So I guess the most things, and we're talking about things that are savage, like digital, right? You know, we don't want to talk about my boring corporate career. But um, I was in that for 15 years. And I was in aerospace. And I found myself in an office uh, running a business, but hating my life. I mean, I was uh, running the company. I'd worked my way up through sales. I had, had you know, had the division. And, and it really was a dream job. I come from a blue collar family from Indiana. And, um, you know, we didn't have much growing up. So I was making, you know, 10 times more than my parents did, had a great job, uh, but was guilty, felt so guilty, like this sucks, what, what, what's going on in my life? And I felt guilty feeling bad about feeling guilty about the job, right? Because I should have been satisfied, but I wasn't. And so um, I wanted more. So I'd listen to Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar and all those old, you know, great guys from years ago and decided that maybe I could do that. So I wrote a book and uh, did what every smart person does is I quit my job and uh, put myself in literally hell. Uh, we lost our house. Um, we lost everything. It was ugly. And uh, I didn't really want to go back to corporate. So I kept fighting. And I, uh, a buddy of mine at this time, there was my space out. So I'm really dating myself, Roman here. Um, but he said, why don't you do something in the morning? And I, whatever, we were, you know, like, I was pretty drunk that night, because I was really depressed. And I said, maybe we could do it, but I don't know if I can get up in the morning and do it. But at that time, uh, there really wasn't anything to do except finding a way to put audio out. So I came from corporate. So I said, let's do a conference call. So I did a conference call in the morning. I used to put stuff on MySpace to say, come listen to this. And I searched for a URL and Morning Coach was there. So I, I didn't have any money left. So I pirated software to build a website, did that over 24 hours and got a website up and literally uh, in 2005 started a conference call it was probably about June of 2005 by putting um, this little like landing page before anybody had landing pages with an email input and I would give them the call in number when I got their email and they would call into my conference line so that's how it all got started uh, and obviously that led to podcasting because after a few months we had too many people listening to the conference call and I needed to find a way to get it out there. So in late 2005, I started searching the internet, which was like Yahoo, or I don't remember what they were back then. It wasn't even Google, right? And the uh, and then podcasting came up, and I didn't even know what it was. So I was just putting stuff out into the internet in like late 2005. So that's how I really got started, which is pretty crazy. And that's awesome. And in terms of kind of quitting your corporate job, was there support from your family? Because you kind of went the route of let's burn the ships and, you know, all in. You know, yeah, other people's don't go that route. But in terms of support around you, how was that taken? Well, you know, my wife always supported me. You know, she was great. She's from Colombia. So she's Colombian and um, just really pr cool person. But I was pretty isolated at that time. You know, I'd grown pretty successful. So my mom and dad really didn't understand what I was doing. They were blue collar factory workers, you know, and I was just somebody who had a lot of friends. A lot of my friends I thought I was crazy. I mean, you know, I had a friend tell me, you know, nobody's ever going to listen to you. Why would anybody listen to you? You know, and uh, a lot of doubters. But then I decided, you know, go do it. And, and I didn't really have support. But I did have a lot of the personal development books. And uh, one of the books I used to read was Wayne Dyer's Wisdom of Life. And um, Wisdom of the Ages, I'm sorry, was the name of the book. And I forget reading that every day to stay motivated. And a cool thing was years later, now I write for Hay House and Wayne Dyer passed away. But a couple of years ago, before he passed away, I got to go on stage and share the stage with him and st tell the story how his book really helped me in some of my darkest moments. That's awesome. And obviously, you've been in podcasting for a while. How have you kept kind of that longevity? Because I, I think the percentage of, you know, podcasters drop off after the first like 10 episodes. 
how have you kind of stayed motivated in terms of sharing for all those years? Well, from 2005 to 2009, I kind of went broke, right? And it was kind of the deal. I wasn't making any money, but my podcast was being downloaded 40,000 times a day. It was top 25. I beat Oprah and Ellen. Uh, it was one of the biggest podcasts out there because iTunes featured it. And it was, it was really awesome. We had, you know, I actually built a website in 2007 with Joomla and we had like 12,000 people in there. And the reason I've stayed with it was in 2009, I was tired of being broke. And so what I did was uh, um, my dog had died. He was a German shepherd. I went to Columbia with my wife and we flew down there and I ended up, um, ended up deciding I was going to go paid. And so in 2009, I went to paid podcasting. And so I would do Mondays for free. And then on Mondays, I would do um, Mondays for free. And then the rest of the week, people would have to pay 20 bucks a month. It's now 30 bucks a month. But in 2009, um, 1,200 of those 12,000 people came with me. And that literally changed my life. That was like becoming a billionaire because that, you know, money that was coming in was residual and it was just huge. So the reason I've stayed with it so long is I think I'm one of the only paid podcasters. And I've had a membership site since 2009 and people pay 30 bucks a month. I do Monday for free and they listen to the rest of the week. Um, and so it's my job. You know, so I actually make money doing it. And I think if I looked at the accumulation over the, the years, it's around $4.5 million I've made doing this thing. So I don't know of too many other people that have been able to sustain that and actually generate that kind of revenue without sponsorships. And so mine has all come from memberships. That's awesome. It's kind of a, the Patreon model before Patreon in a way. Yeah, yeah, where you yeah. can structure it for bonus content or bonus episodes that way as well. Well, it was funny because Harvard had me speak about three months ago on uh, the future of audio education, meaning they want to go to the Chinese model. In, in China, it's a billion dollar industry with micropayments for audio content. There, isn't, there really isn't anything free. And so a lot of the academic educational institutions want to go to a paid model. And I've been doing since 2009. But really, the issue is transitioning people from that, right? Understanding that there is a way to do this. And, and, and Patreon's been great. But even more so is, you know, providing people to understand educational content in audio is actually preferable to video because you can take it with you. Uh, it's just getting the value proposition out, right? And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get the word out that, hey, you know, you need to pay for this stuff. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, it's important. I think it's important. You got into it kind of for the right reasons. You didn't necessarily get into the audio platform to get paid right away. And it was, you know, a byproduct of the success you generated. Because I think in 2020, since the popularity of audio and podcasting, a lot of people jump in and they think they can be Joe Rogan or this and that, you know, the top 10, top 20 earners. And that's simply not the case because it's, it's a hard kind of journey and you may not even get there. Yeah, you know, I've seen that, you know, and I've seen it a couple times. Like I've seen it around, you know, I was in in 2005, 2006 was like the early, you know, early person. Then about 2009, 2010, there was another boom. There was a lot of podcasters that got in and like 2011, 2012, they didn't make any money. So they all quit and podcasting went kind of the other way. And then it's starting to go again. The difference now between, you know, back in 2010, 2011, major media wasn't involved. Now I'm seeing major media, which is even causing it, you know, it's harder for a guy like me to have that success that I had early, right? Because now you have these big players and they're throwing money at getting their podcasts out. And I heard some really crazy numbers. Like there's 10,000 new podcasts that go up a day. So it's, I mean, it's hard. Back when I was going, I mean, there, were, there might've been 10,000 altogether. And that's why I was top 25, right? And now, you know, there's, I mean, there's millions and millions of them. So yeah, it's tough. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but it does mean you're going to have to do it for the right reasons and realize, uh, you know, I don't even call my podcast a podcast. I call it a coach cast because I believe it's valuable and I'm coaching people every morning. And I think that's really the difference is trying to transition to something that's paid or do it to build your brand and get cool people on and have fun with it. And that'll work too. Yeah, I think it's overall kind of adding value because obviously you're adding value in your content, but you know, people just simply come on just to, you know, just to talk, which is nice, but you know, in terms of developing an audience and having people stay and listen and come back, you have to add some kind of value to the, uh, to the platform. All about value. And I think that's the thing. And I think, you know, when as entrepreneurs is, is we should be focused on that. And, you know, I always say it's pretty simple. Just solve problems. You solve problems, you're going to be, you know, you're going to win. And, you know, what type of problems are you solving? And if you, you know, get ready to get on the microphone or whatever you're doing and you're not solving somebody's problem, uh, there's an issue there. So, you know, what problems are you solving and what are they worth? That's the key. Yeah, I agree.
So what motivates you to succeed? Um, you know, I don't know. That's a great question. You know, especially now, you know, I'm, I'm pretty financially stable. I've built a free life. I play golf every day. I'm done by 930. Um, I'm, I'm motivated now because I want to take the next step of my journey. I teach something called ILD, which is, you know, most people, if they can create residual streams from five to $15,000 a month, they can be free depending if they're single or have a family, but 15,000, you can get a nice house, cars, you might not have a Bentley, but you can live a great life. I call it the FU lifestyle instead of FU money, right? I don't know if we can swear, but I would say what that is, but um, you know, you can build a great life around residuals. So my life has been built that way where I can play golf. I don't worry about what anybody thinks. You know, I don't care about my social media. If somebody likes or dislikes me, I could care less. Um, I've built a great platform to allow me to be free. So my next thing is, and why I'm doing shows and getting out is uh, I want to put 500 plus people in my system. And the way I work is 500 people that spend $2,000 a year with you, uh, either $167 a month or whatever combination is a million dollars of revenue added to the business. So over the next two years, um, I'm looking to put another 500 plus people in with minimal advertising because I'm going to buy an airplane and buy a house in Indiana with that money um, that I accumulate. That would be an annual 1 million additional into my business. So I'm focused on that. I had 19 people join in January with no advertising and that's an aggregate. That was an increase. Uh, so we're on track to do it maybe in two years. We have so far in February, we've had about uh, 16 people above what we've lost. So I'm right on that track to get those 500 people. And now I'm starting to get out a little bit more. So that's what motivates me. It's like I got the carrot out there uh, to, 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 to do some cool things. Now I would, I, I just want to preface this. I wouldn't recommend that to everybody that's just getting started. I have a business been established. If you're just getting started, get to that $5,000 or $15,000 a month mark. So you can be free. That would be the first goal. No, yeah, I agree. And I think like, as you said, your motivation has changed throughout periods of your life. Obviously, if you don't have a family and you're single, your motivations are one thing, then you have to support your family. Then if you're working a corporate scenario and you're unhappy, maybe motivated to kind of, you know, jump ship and do your own thing. And if you're an entrepreneur, then building a business, like you said, developing a residual income. So I think different parts of your life, that's obviously not a constant and that's an ever, you know, changing thing technically. Agreed. I, I think it's, it's a, it's a constantly moving target. In fact, you can't get too far ahead or, or too far behind. You got to stay in the moment. And, you know, I'm a metaphysical teacher. I have a PhD in metaphysics. That's my life. I study that and I love it. You know, I'm more of a spiritual guy, but I'm a hardcore charger. I train with Israelis. I got a big knife thing coming up this weekend, but yet I'm also a peace, love and happiness metaphysical guy. And the truth is there is power in the moment and getting too far ahead of yourself uh, can cause issues. So you got to find out, you know, what's going to make you happy. What's going to, what's the experience you need. And sometimes it's just talking to your 12 year old daughter again, or, you know, fixing the relationship with your girlfriend. I mean, it's, those are the things that are important. Sometimes we get so far ahead. We're worried about building this million dollar thing or doing this, that we forget about the little things that really bring happiness. Yeah, I agree. So what's one thing that you've seen as a weakness in yourself in the past that you've turned around and utilized as a strength today? Ooh, I got a lot of weaknesses, man. I'm still, I'm still working on a lot of them right now. Um, and I'm still working on a lot of weaknesses right now as we speak. It's after this weekend. I was like, man, I got to restructure some things. Um, I think, gosh, what was a weakness I turned into strength? Man, I can just think of all my weaknesses. I can't think of many that I turned into strength. I think health. I mean, really, um, like I mentioned, the Israeli stuff that I train. I, when I was first starting off in business, I, I went the opposite direction. I lost a lot of weight. I wasn't fit. I didn't feel good. And I met a guy who's ex Israeli special forces and he just killed me. He literally, you know, just made me start working out. And when that happened, I transitioned. Um, I used to speak at blog world back in the day with Ferris and Vaynerchuk and all oh, good old days. And I got a picture for me on stage and I looked like a heroin addict, you know, and you know, my business was never doing good then. And I always wondered why. And I really think you know, the fitness aspect of really getting stronger and not only physically, but mentally changed the game for me. And that's what made a difference. So I think my weakness was I was actually weak as an individual, as a person, I wasn't strong. And that change really uh, shifted my business and everything. Yeah, I think it's, it's balance. And a lot of entrepreneurs, startup founders neglect certain things like their mental health was, you know, depression and leading to suicide is high in the kind of entrepreneur startup community. And I think aligning health because when you align that health component you get that clarity you get those endorphins i think i like like my most clear time is coming back or going for a run and then trying to tackle a challenge that you know i have for that day in terms of 
work or a client and that kind of thing. But if you don't have that, eventually your health will slip either, you know, weight gain, weight loss, and uh, that's not going to transition well to what you're trying to do in your business. No, you got to have energy. You know, you got to be have energy. I mean, last week I just had my masterminds. I mean, it was going all day, you know, rocking with people and, uh, you know, and, and I got three golf tournaments coming up and my training this weekend. So you got to have energy if you're going to do some cool things in life. And, you know, health has is, is got to be a priority for that. Yeah, I agree. So what's one piece of advice you have for the audience? Uh, one piece of advice would be to stick with it. I mean, I think the thing that I, I, I think the breakdown for most people is that life is the, the progression of the dream. It's the little steps that we take every day. It's not the giant leap. And I think so many people give up way too early. Like you said, somebody that, you know, started podcasting quits after 10. Well, hell, my podcast wasn't even good to 100. I mean, and it wasn't even good then. I mean, I, I didn't even get any traction to like 300. So if you're giving up after 10, man, you're giving up way too early. And I think you got to do stuff every day. You know, if you've got a dream, and that's one of the things, one of the things we talked about in my mastermind last week, it was coming up is like life takes over. And the things that are really going to change your life in two to five years, you know, the things that are really, really important, all of a sudden they get pushed to the side because you're, you know, you're a parent and you're taking care of your kids and, you know, all of a sudden your job takes over and all the things that are really going to make the change get pushed to the side. And so what I would suggest is you do something small every day with your dream. You know, I picked up a guitar for the first time in uh, 25 years. I haven't touched a guitar. A guy stole my guitars back in the day and I had no money to replace them. And I really felt this like angst about picking up a guitar. And so a month ago, I bought a new guitar and literally every day I'm working on it. And I suck. I suck really bad. And I know I'm going to suck probably for the next year. But if I keep working on it every day, I'm going to get better. Same thing in life. Pick those things that are going to really make a difference in two to five years. So then maybe it's not going to happen tomorrow, but in two to five years, this is what's going to make your life better and do a little bit of that every day. Don't ever forget to, to leave that off the list. Keep it on the list and make sure you're doing something every day. Yeah. I mean, I think it's important to take those little steps, how little they may be. And you think they may be, you know, incons inconsequential now, but they do add up and that traction builds up over time. And I think it's important to move towards your goal in that sense as well. A hundred percent. I mean, my, I'm on 3,786 in my primary show. I mean, and some people say, well, teach me how to podcast. So I go do a thousand and then we can talk, you know, but it's, it's just, you know, the small steps along the way, believe me, my first hundred sucked. My first 200 sucked. I mean, I was not very good at this and I don't know if I'm good at it yet but it works and um, I'm having fun and putting great energy out there and doing it every day. And I think that's the difference. Yeah. And I think it's like constant evolution. So, I mean, my first 10, 20, 30, 40 episodes were like horrendous in my opinion. I mean, it's still a work in progress now in terms of the audio editing and like me being a perfectionist in that and then building a set visuals, video, incorporating things over time. And then you develop like a legitimate show with all aspects and you keep learning and keep redefining over time. Yep. It's, it's becoming a pro, right? I mean, that's really what you're doing. And over time you become a pro and a pro does it pretty quick and fast and efficient and makes it easy. I'm a big Metallica fan. And, you know, I didn't realize James Hetfield wrote all the guitar parts, the most of them. And he cheats with his fingers. I mean, he's that good. That's what a pro does. I can't cheat. You know, I'm trying to learn Metallica and it's like, no wonder he plays so fast. And he's, it's amazing because he is a pro. And the reason he's a pro, he's been doing it for, for, I don't know how long they've been around 35 years, whatever, but he is a pro. And, uh, to become a pro, it takes time, energy, and effort. You got to be willing to sacrifice, put in that time to get it done. Yeah, and I think you made a good point about quitting too early because the the long game it's outlasting everybody else. So everybody's going to get you know deterred, deterred, or have a negative uh, attitude at some point, or be down that it's not working what they're trying to do. But they may be away, may may be away like a week away from a breakthrough, and they'll never know it because they didn't persevere through that kind of hard time. 100%. We overestimate so bad what we can do in a short time. We all do. All of us overestimate. We can do this. It's going to get done that fast. But what we underestimate is what we can do in a long time, you know, and, and that's really the secret. And that's what I really try to get people to understand is, you know, stop underestimating the long term, have that long term vision and stick with it. And, and you'll be surprised where you end up. Yeah, I agree. So I really appreciate you jumping on today. Can you let the audience know how they can find you? Yeah, for sure. We can go to morningcoach.com. And you know what? I love the savage word, man. I love that. I love savage. So what we'll do is we'll do morningcoach.com forward slash savage. 
and I have some cool stuff. I have like um, a client acquisition blueprint. I'll give them for free. I actually do some coaching and stuff. So, you know, we can do some, um, I do some one-on-ones once in a while. So there's some cool stuff on that page. We'll do morningcoach.com forward slash savage. I love that word. It's so cool. Awesome. Thanks again for stopping by. No, no problem, Roman, man. Glad to, glad to be here, brother. It's awesome.